390. This old-time radio program was originally aired live, long before the advent of high fidelity. We hope, however, that any variance in audio quality will not take away from your pleasure in listening to this, one of the all-time favorite shows. <laughs> The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce. The makers of Grove's Bromo Quinine Tablets bring you another adventure of Sherlock Holmes with Basil Rathbone as Sherlock Holmes and Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson. A cold is a miserable thing. A cold may become a dangerous thing. Even a so-called light cold can take a serious turn. Be prompt, be decisive in your treatment of a cold. At the very first sign of a cold, take Grove's bromoquinine tablets. And now, here we are again on our usual visit to Dr. Watson. He's waiting for us in his study. A cheerful blaze crackling on the heart. I'm very relieved to see you, Mr. Manning. Hasn't the weather been atrocious today? I was beginning to wonder if you'd be able to get here tonight through all this fog. Yes, it certainly is what you Londoners call a regular pea super. Yes, <laughs> indeed. It reminds me of the adventure of the missing submarine plans. A case that was solved in the underground. Underground? What you Americans call a, a subway. Yes, but what has a solution in a subway got to do with a foggy night? Well, you see, the affair started in weather exactly like this. It was the third week in November... The year 1895, to be exact. On Monday, a dense yellow fog had settled down upon London. On Thursday, it was still there, thickier and, and murkier than ever. At first, Holmes had turned his nervous energy to cross-indexing his huge reference books. But when, after pushing our breakfast chairs back for the, for the fourth morning, we saw the greasy brown swirl still drifting past the windows, Holmes's patience snapped. Holmes, if you must pace around in circles, I wish you'd change directions now and then. You're, you're making me dizzy. Bah! It's inexcusable, Watson. Inexcusable. No initiative, no imagination. Nothing ever gets done. If you're alluding to the inactivity in this last session of Parliament, my dear Holmes... I'm not speaking of our lawmakers, Watson, but of our lawbreakers. The London criminal is certainly a dull fellow. What makes you say that? Well, look out of the window. Ideal weather for committing a crime. The criminal advances on his intended victim practically unseen. He pounces! And disappears into thin air. <laughs> there have been numerous petty thefts, ah, I believe. Petty, petty thefts, pickpockets, ragamuffins. What's the country coming to? Now, if I were a criminal, Watson. Well, I, for one, would move to America. <laughs> oh, hello, hello. Mrs. Hudson is knocking excited. What's up, I wonder? Yes, Mrs. Hudson, what is it? Oh, a telegram for me. Uh, yes, sir. Very well, thank you. Oh, well, well, what's it say? Oh, wait until I open it, can't you? Ah, dear me, what next? Most unusual, Watson, most unusual. What's most unusual, Watson? What's it, sir? Well, it's from my brother, Mycroft. You remember him. He helped us solve the case of the Greek interpreter. He's coming here. Why not? What's so phenomenal about Why this? not? Why not, indeed? It's as startling as it would be to meet a tram car coming down a country lane. Yes, yes, now I come to think of it, uh, Mycroft is rather like a tram car. His rails lead from his Pall Mall lodgings to the Diogenes Club in Whitehall. That's his circle. I wonder what upheaval could have derailed him. Doesn't the telegram explain? It says, uh, must see you about Cadogan West, coming at once. Cadogan West? Cadogan West? Why, that's the young chap who's found dead in the underground on Tuesday morning. I remember reading about it in the papers. Oh? The young man had apparently fallen out of the train and, and killed himself. He hadn't been robbed, and there was no reason to suspect violence. Quite an uninteresting case, if I remember correctly. And yet... It's serious enough to cause Mycroft to alter his habits. No, Watson. This must be an extraordinary event. Uh, do you recall any other facts about the affair? Yes, I come to think of it, there was one unusual bit about... Uh, came out of the inquest. They were unable to ascertain at what point he entered the train, because his ticket was missing. Strange. What articles were found on the body? Oh, two pounds fifteen, I believe it was, a checkbook and... Oh, yes, 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 two dress circle tickets for the Woolwich Theatre... Dated for that evening. Theater tickets, eh? 
And it wasn't suicide. A man doesn't procure theater tickets for the evening on which he intends to end his life. Anything else? A small packet of technical papers. Technical papers? What kind of technical papers? The, new, the newspapers didn't say. Ah, as serious as that. What did the young man do? Where was he employed? He was a clerk at Woolwich Arsenal. Ah, government employee. There we have it, Watson. British government, Woolwich Arsenal, technical papers. That's why Mycroft is involved in this affair. I don't understand. No, I suppose not. Watson, have I ever told you what Mycroft is? Your brother, of course. Oh, no, 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 Watson. Do you have to be so dense? I mean, do you know what he does? Hmm? I seem to have some vague recollection that you once told me that he'd held some small office under the British government. It would be more accurate to say, in a way, that he is the British government. What? His position is unique. He made it for himself. As the tidiest and most orderly brain of any man alive with a great capacity for storing facts and giving them the proper interpretation. The conclusions of every government department are passed on to him. He's the central exchange, the clearinghouse. Again and again, his word has decided the national policy. He thinks of nothing else. Nothing else can lure him from his contemplations. And yet he's coming here. Yes, Jupiter is descending on us today. What on earth can happen? Uh, uh, Watson, that sounds suspiciously like a bad pun. Ah, here he is, if I'm not mistaken, to speak for himself. Come in, come in. Hello, Mycroft. What's up? What's up? You look flustered. Most annoying business, Sherlock. Most annoying. You know how I dislike altering my habits. Extremely awkward for me to come away from the office, particularly with Siam in its present state. Oh, dear me. Yeah, sit down, Mycroft. Sit down. Uh, you know, Watson, of course. Yes, yes, of course. Right. I'm trying to find a chair that I can trust to hold yeah, me. I'd better take the sofa. If you certainly hadn't got any thinner. I've never seen the Prime Minister so upset. As for the Admiralty, it's buzzing like an upset beehive. You know anything about the case? Uh, Watson's just been telling me what was in the newspapers. Uh, just what were the technical papers found on the body? Sherlock, for the love of heaven, not so loud. Those papers which so wretched youth had in his pocket were none other than the plans of the Bruce Partington submarine. Oh? The submarine which would completely revolutionize naval warfare. The most important papers in our government archives. Under no circumstances could they be removed from the office. Even the chief constructor of the Navy was forced to go to Woolwich if he desired to consult them. And yet we find them in the pockets of a dead junior clerk in the heart of London. Yeah, from an official point of view, it's deplorable, my dear Mycroft. Simply deplorable. You may laugh, Sherlock, but this country won't be safe until they are recovered. But I thought you said that they were found in the pocket of this chap, Cadogan West. Ten papers taken from Woolwich. Seven were found in the pockets of Cadogan West. Three are still missing, the three essential ones. To recover those three papers is imperative. Why did Cadogan West stay? How did his body reach the place where it was found? And where are the missing papers? Find the answer to those questions, Sherlock, and you'll have done your country an invaluable service. Oh, why don't you solve it yourself, Mycroft? I believe you could. Mm, possibly. But it's a question of digging out details. Give me the details and I can give you the solution from an armchair. No, when it comes to running about and cross-questioning railway guards and lying on one's face with a lens to one's eye... <laughs> no, no, that's not my major. <laughs> your figure prevents your taking such an undignified position, eh? <laughs> Very well. Leave that part of it to us, eh, Watson? <laughs> that's all. Good. I've got a cab waiting outside to take the place where the body was found. I can give you the details on the way. <laughs> Who was the official guardian of these famous papers? No less a personage than Sir James Walter, a gentleman who's grown grey in the service. His patriotism is beyond suspicion. A uh, bachelor, if I'm not mistaken, lives with his brother. Yes. He was at the house of Admiral Sinclair at Berkeley Square during the whole of the evening when this accident occurred. The Admiral vouches for him. He's one of the two who have the only keys to save. And his key was with him all evening? Right. His key, the key to the building, the key to the room. Hmm. Who was the man with the other key? The senior clerk, Mr. Sidney Johnson. Man of 40, married, silent, morose, with an excellent service record. Any alibi? He, too, had his key with him and seems to have spent the evening playing a game of drafts with a greengrocer around the corner from his lodgings. Of course, he has only the word of this greengrocer to back him oh, up. Oh, come, come, my dear Mycroft. No class discriminations, please. The word of a greengrocer is often just as good as that of an admiral. Now, what about Cadogan West? He had a good reputation. A bit hot-headed, but straight and honest. At least, everyone thought so. He was next to Sidney Johnson at the office. His duties brought him into daily personal contact with the plans. No one else ever had the handling of them. Oh, it's perfectly clear. He must have taken... Ah, not so fast, Watson, not so fast. Who locked them up that night? Mr. Sidney Johnson. Ah, 
They were of value, commercially, I mean. Oh, yes. There's no doubt that West could have got several thousands for them very easily. And yet, only a small amount of money was found on the body. Perhaps the buyer took it back after he'd murdered West. Ah, what puzzles me is, how did West obtain possession of those papers? To do so, he must have had a false key. Several false keys, Sherlock. He had to open the building and the room as well. Oh, well, well, well. Several false keys, then. Let me see, let me see. Suppose West did take the papers and went into town. And on the way back to Woolwich, Wafers, he's killed and thrown from the train. But the spot where the body was found is considerably past the station for London Bridge, which is the route to Woolwich. Ah, that's interesting. Also, if young West did make an appointment with some foreign agent to sell the papers that night, why didn't he keep the evening clear? Why buy two theater tickets? Exactly. Furthermore, he actually escorted his fiancée halfway there before he disappeared. A blind. That's what it looks like to me. Why did he take the papers at all? Why not copy them out in the office and sell the copies? He certainly had plenty of opportunity to do so. And why the absence of his underground ticket? Perhaps the ticket would have shown us which station was near the agent's house. So the murderer destroyed it. Good, Watson. Very good. <laughs> and yet... I wonder. Well, here's the underground station. The railway authorities have sent a man round to show you the exact place where the body was found. You won't change your mind and come with us? Well, crawling round that black hole on my hands and knees, <laughs> not very really likely. Well, I shall expect a report on your efforts this evening. Uh, I never expect too much, Mycroft. Never expect too much. <laughs> Before we follow Holmes and Watson into the mazes of the London subway system, I have a word of advice. Every year, colds cause a lot of sickness. Every year, they cause a lot of expense and time lost from work. Always regard a cold seriously. Always treat it earnestly. At the first sign of a cold, take Grove's bromoquinine tablets. Bromoquinine tablets are famous relief for the distress of a cold. Their efficacy has been fully established. Bromoquinine tablets go right to work on a cold symptom. They don't waste any time. They directly relieve the misery of a cold. They help reduce the fever of a cold. Thousands of people keep bromoquinine tablets handy all winter. Thousands of people depend on them as their relief for colds. No other preparation enjoys greater confidence than bromoquinine tablets. Follow the example of millions, and at the first sign of a cold, take Grove's bromoquinine tablets. Get them at any drugstore, a few cents a box. Ask specifically for Grove, G-R-O-V-E-S, Bromo, B-R-O-M-O, Quinine, Q-U-I-N-I-N-E, Grove's Bromo Quinine Tablets. This way, sir. Step right along the tracks. It isn't safe. Supposing a train should come shooting round that curve. Oh, that's all right, sir. There won't be another for five minutes anyway. Here we are, sir. This is where they found the body. Right here alongside the rails. Lying on its face, it was. Mm, spooky old place, eh, Holmes? Like the catacombs, only without the skeletons. No. Yeah. Anything in his hands when they found him? No, sir. Were they clenched? Or spread out as if he were protecting himself? No, sir. They was what you might call relaxed. Ah. What time did all this happen? Well, sir, the train he was hoisted out of, as near as we can figure, passed along here about midnight on Monday. All the carriages have been examined for signs of violence, I suppose. They didn't find nothing, not even the missing ticket. There was a passenger to Allgate on the ordinary train, about 11.40 it was. He said he'd heard heavy thud, like something striking the line, just before the train reached this station. But it was so foggy, he said he was blessed if he could see what it was. Holmes, what's the matter? What are you staring at? The curve, Watson. The what curve of the rails. What of it? What do you what do you mean? I suppose there aren't many curves as abrupt as this. No, sir, I can't say as there is. What have curves got to do with it? Oh, an indication, Watson. Merely an indication. Hmm, unique. Perfectly unique. And yet why not? I don't see any indications of bleeding on the line. No, sir, there wasn't any to speak of. But I understand there was a considerable wound. The bone was crashed right enough. Holmes! You hear that? It's a train. It's, it's coming this way. Run, sir. Run for your life. Yes, this would where? Uh, up ahead. There's a place where the train switches off. Run, Watson, run. It's just around the curve. Well, we'll never make it. We, yes, we will. Faster, faster. Uh, there's a switch up ahead. Come on. Here comes the train now. We'll make it. We'll make it. Ah, uh, Justin. Watson, for the love of heaven. You're on the wrong track. This concludes the first part of this cassette. Please turn the cassette over and begin again on side two. Well, 
Well, that was a narrow escape, Holmes. I, I must say my knees are still shaking. Look at the shoulder of my coat where you pulled it there. Lucky thing for you that I did. Where are we off to now in, in this fog? Yes, it's a nice afternoon. Suppose we pay a few calls. I think Sir James Walter claims our first attention. After that, we might drop in on Miss Westbury. Miss Westbury? Who's she? She is Cadogan West's fiancée and the last person to see him alive. Holmes, we seem to be going around in circles. We've accomplished absolutely nothing so far except to get to, to get ourselves nearly annihilated in the underground. After all, it's perfectly obvious that the young man had a quarrel with someone, in all probability to the agent, to whom he sold the papers, and got himself thrown out of the railway carriage for his pay. I disagree with you, my dear Watson. His body fell from the roof of the carriage where it had been placed. Cadogan West met his death elsewhere. The roof? A. The curve in the tracks. The body is found at a spot where the train pitches and sways as it comes around the points. B. There was no ticket. C. There were no signs of bleeding on the line because the body had bled elsewhere. Of course. Everything fits together, but... But where was the body placed on the train? I think I can make a fair guess at that, my dear Watson. Ah. Oh, here we are. This is the famous official villa of Sir James Walter. And that, if I'm not mistaken, is his brother, Colonel Ballantyne, just coming out of the house. What's the matter with the man? He, he looks positively haunted. Oh, uh, pardon me, Colonel Ballantyne, but can you tell me if, uh, if Sir James is at home? Uh, Sir James, sir? Sir James is dead. Good heavens, dead? He died this morning. It's terrible. Terrible. How did he die? Oh, it's this horrible scandal. My brother, sir, was very sensitive of his honor. He couldn't survive the disgrace to his department. It broke his heart. Pardon me, gentlemen, I must go. It, it broke his heart. Most appalling development. Eh, Holmes? Uh, I wonder if his death was natural or if the poor fellow killed himself. <laughs> Yes. Will you tell Miss Westbury that Mr. Sherlock Holmes would like to see her? Oh, please come in, gentlemen. I'm Val Westbury, Mr. Holmes. I've been expecting you ever since I heard you had taken the case. Please be seated. Well, thank you. Oh, Mr. Holmes, we, we must save his good name. He couldn't have done it. Cadogan was the most chivalrous patriotic gentleman on earth. He, he couldn't have done it. He would have cut his right hand off rather than sell a state secret. But the facts, my dear Miss Westbury. I admit I can't explain them. Uh, was he in need of money? No, Mr. Holmes. His need was simple and his salary very good. He'd saved several hundred pounds. We were to be married at the new year. I see. Had you noticed any signs of mental excitement? Why, I... Well, that is... Uh, come, Miss Westbury, be frank with us. Yes, Mr. Holmes. That night, I... I had a feeling that there was something on his mind. Mm -hmm. Tell us about it, will you? We were on the way to the theater. It was a foggy night, you remember? We were walking slowly. Our way took us close to his office. Cadogan seemed thoughtful and worried. <laughs> Darling, what's the matter? You haven't said a word for the last five minutes. Have I said or done something? Of course not, silly. It's just that I've got something on my mind. Oh, why not tell me about it? Perhaps I can help. It's no use, Vi. It's too serious for me to talk about, even to you. You know, sometimes, Caddy, I feel just the least little bit jealous of that old job of yours when you're cooped up in that building all day. Oh, now you're not going to be jealous of a building. <laughs> well, not really. But it is funny to think of a husband having secrets he can't tell his wife. Mighty important secrets, I can promise you. There's one in particular that any foreign spy would pay good money to get hold of. How thrilling. Well, I don't know. They're awfully slack about some things over there in that building, Violet. What's too slack? It would be too confounded easy for a trader to get his hands on those plans. What plan? Oh, never mind, darling. I guess I'm getting a bit melodramatic. But there's something been worrying me. Hello, what's that? What's what? Over there, that shadow moving along the side of the building. It's a man. So that's it. I always suspected... Oh, what's the matter? You're so excited. What's wrong? Stay here, Violet. There's something I have to find out. Stay here. <laughs> waited and waited, but he never returned. Oh, Mr. Holmes, if you could only save his honor, it, it meant so much to him. We shall do our best, Miss Westbury. This, uh, this shadow, this man moving along the building, did you see it too? I think I did, Mr. Holmes. But the night was so foggy, I can't be sure. But there must have been a man. Another man. It, it couldn't have been Cadogan. Surely character goes for something. Let us hope so. Come along, Watson. We must return home. I'm expecting an answer to some telegrams I sent Mycroft earlier this afternoon. 
We've done enough for one day. Holmes, where have you been all day? You left this morning before I was up. Now you've come home with your towel awry, your suit torn, and as ravenous as a wolf. <laughs> yes, I've had a bit of exercise, my dear Watson. Uh, pass me the tongue, will you? It would have done you good to go along. Yes, what were you doing? Investigating the premises inhabited by foreign spies known to have been in London on last Monday. Mycroft sent me a list of them. Took a bit of doing, too. Climbing walls, breaking into cellars, prowling around rooftops. Well? I discovered there was only one residence which had the uh, proper facilities for disposing of West's body after the murder. Well, whose residence was that? It belonged to a Hugo Oberstein. The address is 13 Corfield Gardens, Kensington. The gentleman himself has departed for Europe. Gone, has he? He took the plans with him. It's, it's too late. Not necessarily, Watson. What can we do now? We're going to keep a rendezvous with the gentleman who stole and sold those plans. The assignation will take place at Mr. Oberstein's house this evening at nine. What the deuce are you talking about? Uh, these newspaper clippings. I found them in the drawer of Hugo Oberstein's desk. Read them. Hmm. The Daily Telegraph agony column. The first one says, Two complex for description must have full report. Terms agreed. Two payable when goods delivered. Signed, Piero. Piero, indeed. Sounds like a Mardi Gras. Now, read on, Watson. Read on. Second goes, matter presses must withdraw offer unless contract completed. Piero again. And the last, dated Monday, the day the crime is committed. Monday night after nine, two taps, payment in hard cash. I say, do you think it was a submarine that, that the plans that, that he was buying? I'm almost positive. And Piero was Oberstein himself. But we'll find out for certain this evening. I've invited the gentleman who sold the papers to meet us. But how? I don't understand. I inserted this advertisement in today's Daily Telegraph. Tonight, same hour, same place, two taps, vitally important. Your own safety at stake. Signed, Piero, as usual. By George, if he answers that, we've, we've got him. Unless we're too late. Come along, Watson, there's no time to lose. You can take this passage, uh, pa package for a change. I'll, uh, I've been carrying it around all day. Well, what's in it? Oh, just a jemmy, a dark lantern, a chisel and a revolver. Nice equipment for a respectable citizen to be carrying about the streets of London. I must... Yeah, you know, Watson, there are times when I suspect we aren't quite respectable. <laughs> Here we are. This is Caulfield Gardens. Thank heavens, it's still foggy. I shouldn't like to be caught in the act of housebreaking. Yeah. Over this wall, Watson. There's a window we can easily pry open in the back. Scale that wall? Oh, come on, hurry up, hurry up. There's no time to lose. Here, here. I'll give you a boost. Mm. Come on, up you. Oh, good. That's it. Look out, here I come. I must say, Holmes, you're as agile as a cat. <laughs> it's uncanny. This is the window. Light the lantern and give me the jemmy. One. Two. Mr. Holmes, the underground runs right past here, almost on the level of these windows. I could have reached out and touched it. Yes, quite convenient, wasn't it? It was here the body was placed on the roof of the train. Look out of this, uh, look on this windowsill. Hmm? You can see the soot is blurred where they rested the body. And here, look here, look, look. This brown stain is blood. Uh, nasty, eh, Holmes? Let's, let's get on to the house. Very well, then. Come along, come along. The window's open. Easy, easy, don't break the glass. Supposing Oberstein should happen to return home. Well, we must take our chances in this business. Come along, Watson, come along. My visitor will expect to be let in by the front door. I wish these stairs didn't, didn't squeak so. Nine o'clock. We can expect him at any moment now. You take your position on one side of the door. I'll be on the other. So we can pounce on him when he enters. I'll throw my greatcoat over his head. Oh, well, I, I wish he'd hurry. Shh, Watson. Well, what, what if he doesn't come? There he is. Ready now. I'll open the door. You wanted me? No, you don't. Oh. Take that. What the hell you? Easy, Watson, easy. All right, Holmes, I've got him. Well, let's take a look at our catch. Take the overcoat away, Watson. All right. Hi, it's, it's Colonel Valentine Walker, Walter, Sir James's brother. Quite. Well, sir, what have you to say for yourself? Why did you steal the Bruce Partington plans? Who are you? What do you know about this? I am Sherlock Holmes, and I know everything. Oh, this is terrible. I'm lost. I didn't realize their importance until my brother killed himself. But I needed the money. I had to have it. Oberstein offered to give it to me if I'd let him see the plans. So you took an impression of your brother's key, opened the safe, and procured the papers. Cadogan West saw you leaving the building, followed you here, and you killed him. No, I didn't do that. I swear I didn't do it. No? Then perhaps you'd better tell us who did murder Cadogan West and placed him on the roof of the railway carriage. I'll tell you. I promise you I will. I did the rest. I confess it, but, but not that. Very well, then. How did it happen? 
I got the papers, as you've discovered. Made my way through the fog until I reached the door. Once or twice, I fancied I was being followed. I could hear footsteps on the pavement behind me. Colonel Walter? Yes. You have the papers? Yes. Let me in, quick. I think someone's been following me. Yes, it's me. You can't do this, Valentine. It's treason. Corey, do you hear? No. You can't sell the papers, Valentine. I won't let you. They should see. Look out. Uh, Take that. Uh, How do you like that, my impetuous young friend? Papa Oberstein, he knows how to use a blackjack, eh? You, you, you've killed him. So? It's murder. I'm going to get out of this. Oh, no. I think different. You will come in here if you do not wish to taste the blackjack, too. But I... I... But... That is better. Oh, what can we do? They'll find the body. I have an idea. First, I look at those papers. I take the ones I want and the rest. We put in the pocket of this foolish young man. And then we give him a nice ride on top of the underground train, no? He will be the guilty one. Who will ever know? What a thoroughly unpleasant gentleman. What a pity that he got away with the papers, Dr. Watson. Oh, but he didn't. Oberstein had left a Paris forwarding address with Colonel Walters. That gentleman sent him a letter dictated by Holmes saying that he had discovered that one essential detail in the plans was missing and that he had procured a tracing which would make it complete for a price. And did Oberstein swallow the bait? (laughs) Did he swallow it? He was arrested as he got off the boat at Folkestone. Some weeks later, I learned incidentally that Holmes had spent a day at Windsor Castle and returned with a remarkably fine emerald type-in. When I asked him where he got it, he answered it was just a small present from a certain gracious little old lady for whom he'd been able to do a... A small f- favor. Yes, and I think I can guess the lady's august name. Elementary, my dear Mr. Manning, elementary. I see. Ladies and gentlemen, in just a moment, Dr. Watson will be back to tell us about next week's story. In the meantime, let us repeat. Watch out for colds. At the first sign of a cold, take Grove's bromoquinine tablets. Bromoquinine tablets are made especially for the relief of colds. In other words, they're specialized medication, and that's what you want. Yes, at the very first sneeze or sniffle, go right to your druggist and get a package of Grove's bromoquinine tablets. Now, Dr. Watson, next week? Next week, I think I'll tell you the story of the lion's mane. The lion's mane. What was that, Dr. Watson? The answer to that question, Mr. Manning, almost stumped Sherlock Holmes himself. Suffice it to say that they were the last words gasped out by a dying man as he lay writhing in agony on the sands of the Sussex coast. You have been listening to a Sherlock Holmes adventure adapted from Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Bruce Partington Plans, with Basil Rathbone as Sherlock Holmes and Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson. The dramatization was by Edith Miser. This program is presented from Hollywood every week at this same time by the makers of Grove's bromoquinine tablets. Quick relief for colds. This is Knox Manning speaking. (laughs) 